Well, um, up next for us, always an important panel discussion for our, for our membership and for our industry. Um, we now and going forward will continue to call this the Kent Sterling Memorial Medication Panel. So today, uh, I'd like to start off by bringing up our committee, National HBPA Committee Chairman on both the Medication Committee as well as the Model Rules Committee. So if I could introduce Dave Basler, the Executive Director of the Ohio HBPA. Over the years that uh, I've served as executive director uh, for the Ohio HBPA, when we return from conventions, I always ask my board members what they thought the best part of the convention was. And almost without fail, other than some of the social activities, the best panel was the medication panel. And there are two gentlemen that who are directly responsible for that. Uh, Mr. Kent Sterling, who we're honoring today, and Mr. Tom Tobin. Uh, I think Kent would be very proud of the panel that discussion that we'll have today. He and I discussed even after him leaving the Florida HBPA on many occasions what we referred to as environmental contamination and the need for screening limits. Uh, what Dr. Tobin probably more diplomatically calls environmental transfer which is a cause for concern in racehorses. It's the inadvertent exposure to recreational and prescription medications. And it's an issue. Um, widespread use of certain medications in our population today. And it causes positives. And we need to get to a spot where those positives that aren't relevant and are due to inadvertent environmental exposure aren't being called as positives. And that's the, the purpose of our discussion today. Um, before we get started, uh, I'm going to do something that Kent always did. I need some honorariums. Uh, if you like the panel today, we brought in experts from across the country, the very best of the best. There's expenses involved in bringing them here. I ask that you go back to your board and, and ask for $1,000, $1,500 to be sent as honorariums so that we can continue to have these type of panels. Um, right now, I'm going to bring up the panel members, give them a brief introduction, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Tobin. <laughs> and I might need Eric to go out in the hall and recruit a few. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
We're missing two of our members because <laughs> we are running a little early, <laughs> are we? Ten twenty-two. Still a few minutes before the official start, and we have two speakers who I saw in the hall a few minutes ago, so they should be in shortly. I, they are out there looking for him. Eric wants to get him. Here's Scott. He's here. I don't know where he is. Down all right? The what? You made it down all right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been here a couple of days. I've been with my wife. It's got in last night.
We're going to go ahead with the introductions. Uh, Hugh Gallagher will join us shortly, um, but I will go uh, straight down the line. Um, and their full bios are in your booklets, and I encourage you to read them. It's an impressive panel. Uh, I will abbreviate them. Um, first off is uh, Dr. Clara Finger. Clara is a practicing vet in Kentucky and was instrumental in the formation of NARV, the North American Association of Racetrack Veterinarians. And Clara is the only person in the sport who I have to say occasionally tone it down on medication. And when that's coming from me, you know it's something. So uh, next to Clara is Dr. Levant Durakalu. Uh, Levant uh, studied under Tom Tobin and is now the director of medication testing at the lab at LSU, which does all the equine medication testing for the state of Louisiana. He took over for Dr. Barker. Uh, next to him is Dr. Scott Stanley. I really appreciate Dr. Stanley making it in today. It's a long trip from California. Uh, Scott is a longtime researcher, professor at the UC Davis, uh, and also runs the UC Davis lab, which does all the medication testing for racing events in California. Uh, we'll skip Hugh right now. Uh, so next in line is Mr. Schultz, uh, who is an expert in equine toxicology and also in the law and if you read his resume uh, it may be more impressive even outside of racing than inside of racing so I, I encourage you to read his bio in your booklets and next to him is a man who needs very little or no introduction to the people in this room longtime national HBPA medication advisor Dr. Tom Tobin thank you very much Dave uh, I, we're going to address today the problem of environmental transfer cause for concern in racehorses, inadvertent exposure to recreational and prescription medications. And we have a number of speakers here. We're going to address it from various aspects. And I've taken the approach of picking a, num a number of uh, medications, substances of concern, and assigning them to individuals. And we're going to get a sequence of presentations. One of the uh, and I also need to acknowledge that in North American racing, the matter of environmental substances started with Ken Sterling many years ago with caffeine in Florida. And he had a law put into place in Florida to prevent the calling of uh, irrelevant trace levels on, on substances. Uh, it was basically thin layer chromatography was the screening method required in Florida. So we just remember Kent, his early contributions and his support of this entire area. I'm going to speak first of all about some recent data that came up in Charlestown, West Virginia. And I'm going to just turn my attention now to the screen. The title of this presentation is ARCI Substances on the Walls of Stalls in the Charlestown Shipping Stalls. Uh, we have my student, Dr. Bacon, uh, Dr. Fenger, George Malan, uh, and Maria Catignani, who Maria is not here. <coughs> Maria, thank you very much. That's excellent. Maria is not here today, but Maria is absolutely a critical part of the presentation you're going to see just now. Now, let me figure out how to... Okay. In Charlestown, we had a sequence of sporadic trace level naproxen, and that's important. It was naproxen identifications. They started in August 2016 when industrial labs took over the drug testing. Contamination of the ship installs was suggested by the horsemen and evaluated by the commission. The way they evaluated it was they swabbed the stalls. Now, I don't have the protocol for the swabbing, but apparently they went in, swabbed portions of a selection of the ship installs, and then they were analyzed by industrial laboratories. Now, whatever else you say about industrial laboratories, they could detect substances. About 50 individual identifications of 30 ARCI substances in the walls of approximately 18 ship installs. 
and these would seem to me to be conclusive, compelling evidence for environmental presence of a number of ARCI substances in a racing environment. So that's the basic message. Uh, the, con the concentrations of the proxins in serum were not particularly low, 6 to 160, which is not low anymore, but the proxin is given at very large doses indeed, which I'll identify later. So that's quite, that's not, a, that's a trace level of the proxin. Um, and so we have there, okay. The specific pro uh, protocol was not available. The sensitivity, sensitivity of testing is not available, but apparently quite sensitive. And we have, that, we have these results. Now the commission did not release the results but Maria made a, an FO, a Freedom of Information request. Our thanks go to Maria, and she's an author on this presentation because this is due to Maria's filing of an F Freedom of Information request. The first thing we look at is the equine medications detected. And number one here, the, the high level one, is naproxen. They have four naproxen identifications in the, These are the ones they reported. The sense I have from looking at the analysis of some of the comments is that the proxim was detected in just about every sample, but they only reported four high ones, okay? We have glycopyrrolate, which is a little surprising. We have three of those in the, the samples. We have flunixin too, that's not in the least surprising. Flunixin is a stable substance, it gets into the environment, when it's in the environment it hangs around and the next horse in will pick it up and you'll have a trace in the horse and when they went in with the swabs, swabbed the stalls, sure enough they picked up flunixin. Acepromazine is a little surprising but there it is. Ketoprofen is not surprising at all, it's a non-steroid like flunixin, relatively high concentrations. Lidocaine, a little surprising, renidine, a little surprising. For a coxib, that one is not surprising, it's a non-steroidal. Isoxaprine, which is the granddaddy, the poster child of environmental contaminant substances, was identified. So bimeprazole, not particularly surprising. Methocarbamol, here we have a methocarbamol, quite consistent with the events that you heard about on the, the uh, events in Kentucky with methocarbamol, a trace in the environment. Guafenicin. Now these are all equine medications, and I haven't totaled the number, but from memory I think it adds up to 19 or 20 individual identifications. Equine medications, uh, this one surprises me a little, uh, none of the others are, are that unexpected. The next one we look at is recreational substances. No surprise here, benzylecanine, eight identifications. The other metabolite, which is the metabolite of cocaine, of course, benzylacognine, acognine methyl ester is another metabolite. We have two, so eight and two are 10. We have two amphetamines, which is a little surprised about amphetamine, but there you are. We have one cocaine itself identified. Now, I don't know, and I haven't determined whether or not these are all in the same stall or not, but at least we have these are identifications. One methamphetamine and Dr. Uh, Mr. Schultz will be speaking about methamphetamine and the amphetamines, one oxycodone, and uh, this is a bath salt that was identified there, and I think this comes up to 16 recreational substances identified in these stalls. Human medications, human prescription over-the-counter medications, metaprolol, a, uh, three of those, a blood pressure medication, methadone, an analgesic, meprobamate, tramadol, which we'll hear a lot about, Metformin, a, 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 a diabetic medication, I believe. Levorfin, dextrofenil, Dr. Fenger is going to discuss that. And N-ethyl nicotinamide, we're not quite sure the significance of that. And a metabolite of methylphenidate or Ritalin. So basically, they went in, they swabbed the stalls, they swabbed them at high sensitivity. We don't know what the actual swabbing protocol is. And they found a lot of substances. Uh, the report from industrial, since uh, stall contamination was an issue for consideration, they could, the report, industrial report said to the commission that, that these are low levels, these are no problem. But what they say is somehow enough material was getting into the stall at some time that it was picked up quite a bit later, presumably when these swabs were taken. And in the meantime, the possibility of exposure to a horse is quite significant in my estimation. 
The practical test of, of stall contamination is to put a fresh horse, a clean horse, into a stall, leave him there for two to three days, and if the stall is effectively contaminated, you would expect to find something in the, the blood or the urine. Uh, BZE is the most common individual contaminant. Further invest they, the industrial noted that further investigation was needed, but those are the, that's the industrial analysis. Uh, that's a quick review and just thanks to, uh, as always, for the support from the National HPPA and the various horsemen's HPPAs that have supported the research. Now, I'm going to tell you a few brief words about naproxen because it shows up very clearly in these stall contamination events. Can we do the naproxen presentation? I have chosen to call it an e major equine environmental substances and the same authors as previously. It's a classic high dose non destroying anti inflammatory. It's up to 10 grams per day. Uh, it's administered orally, so you, it gets into the stall and from, from basically uh, from contamination through the horse feed. It will get in there directly. It will also get in there by passing through the horse. It is clearly stable in the environment. The longer you dose the horse, the more contaminated the stall. Uh, it's, it's administered orally, so it's absorbed orally, and that's why the horse can pick it up from the stall. And as I said, most of the Charlestown stalls showed some evidence of naproxen contamination. This is some Canadian data from 20, maybe even further back. We're looking at the concentrations of naproxen, and they're declining down. Uh, after an administration, and then when you get out here to about four days, it stops declining. In actual fact, one goes up. And this is an alert that there's something going on. This was missed at that time by those authors, and indeed by all the industry. But in actual fact, I believe that's the first evidence of environmental contamination. What you're looking at here, down here, is not the drug passing, uh, being excreted by the horse. You're looking at the drug pass from the stall passing through the horse, so you're looking at it clearing out basically out of the stall, which is much slower than out of the horse. Here is some other data uh, from a later paper on naproxen, and we're looking at urinary concentrations. Of, these are both urinary concentrations, and we can see here out 25 days after the last administration, we're getting it bumping up and down, we're getting naproxen environmental contamination. Uh, the 4 gram dose contains 10 followed by 22 zeros. Now 10 followed by 6 zeros is a million, by 9 zeros is a billion, by 12 is a trillion, and there's a trillion stars in the uh, Milky Way. This is actually approximately, oops, this is actually approximately the number of stars in the known universe. When you put naproxen into a horse, you put a large number of molecules into the stall. Some of them get directly into the stall. Some of them pass through the horse to get into the stall. It's stable. It's orally absorbed. That's the classic environmental substance. Uh, so just leave you with that. That's the simplest model of environmental contamination. We have some slightly more complicated mo models that the, the next speakers will deal with. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Scott, next. you're next. Yeah. Dr. Stanley is going to speak about morphine and environmental substance.
So the older techniques for detection of this was thin layer chromatography. This was used in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s. Uh, the, the detection of that allowed only a short period of time for the drug to be detected by this approach. You can see here uh, the methodology could only detect the drug in the low parts per billion. Uh, urine extracts were used for this. Um, as you can see, Dr. Tobin and I published a paper on ELISA detection. This is a new methodology, allowed for a much more sensitive detection approach. Uh, colleagues of mine, uh, along with Rick Sams, actually identified uh, poppy seed. Let's get rid of that beast. Sorry about the feedback. Um, so we, we published a paper on the identification of, of poppy seeds resulting in identification of morphine. So there are poppy seeds that do contain morphine. It's been known for quite a long time, but it was the first time that they were administered to horses and resulted in identification. And that was all due to a, a finding of a positive in California uh, in the uh, early 19, uh, 1990s. Uh, so several publications have been demonstrated using methodologies for identifying and reporting morphine in horse urine samples. Currently, our methodology is even more sensitive than it was in the past, uh, which is some of the reason that we're even talking about potential environmental contamination in some of these cases, because our capability to detect drugs, as you can see here on this slide, is far greater than it was. It improves substantially with Dr. Tobin's ELISA test, even more so now with the instrumental uh, analytical procedures for LCMS. So these substances can be detected at lower levels. So I just wanted to get that started. Poppy seeds themselves are not that native to most of the United States. Uh, in, fact, in fact, California has a poppy plant as its, national, as its state flower. That poppy does not contain any morphine. There's a number of them that do not. So it is not quite as exposed or contaminated as perceived, but there are poppies that grow in the United States that do have some morphine. As many of you may know, uh, in England there have had multiple problems with this. Feed contamination for different uh, products that were mixed in with horse feed. The Queen's horse a few years ago tested positive for morphine uh, in, a, in a very big group stakes race over there. Gold Cup, the Queen's Gold Cup was taken away and the horse was disqualified. Uh, the trainer was not sanctioned though, however, because it was felt that uh, there was enough information to demonstrate it was a contamination from the feed. Uh, you can see because of that, the BHA, British Horse Racing Authority, uh, had a cluster of findings. I think they actually had eight in total that they attributed to feed contamination, all related to the same feed company. I think it was Red's uh, Feed Mill. Is that right, Dr. Tobin? I think, I think you're right. Okay. And then the Equest uh, Federation Equestrian International is an organization that also has recognized that uh, morphine is a substance that can show up in feed. Uh, they have combined that with other products, codeine and uh, other opiate related substances that allowed them to determine that this was a contamination. So it's by use of additional markers of, of exposure that you can determine whether the, the morphine in the sample is from a feed contamination issue, uh, other sources, or actual administration. Uh, they can use that information to define more specifically nowadays whether the morphine source is from a pharmaceutical preparation or from an oral exposure of a opiate contaminated uh, poppy seed product. So FEI has taken steps to change their regulations due to this. And they've also downgraded morphine from a banned substance to a substance that they know could be from environmental exposure. So several different racing organizations and federal, uh, national, international organizations have identified morphine as a potential contaminant, sourcing it back to feed contamination in most cases from products that were mixed in with horse feed and fed uh, to those horses unbeknownst to the trainers. That's all I had on morphine. Tom. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanley, for that outstanding presentation. Uh, 
We'll now move to the, the next environmental substance of concern in North America, which is benzyl echinine, uh, which we saw a large number of identifications of in the Charlestown stalls. And Dr. Dericolou will make a presentation on benzyl echinine. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The title of my presentation is Benzylacony, the cutoffs in place in number of North American racing jurisdictions. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to give you an idea about cocaine exposure in terms of environmental contamination and the rationale behind why some of the racing jurisdictions in North America have cutoff limits uh, for cocaine exposure based on urinary level of its major metabolite, which is benzyl acanine. As you know, uh, cocaine is an ARCI class one drug. In other words, cocaine has the highest abuse potential to affect the racing performance. Cocaine is very powerful addictive stimulant and after marijuana, it is the most commonly abused drug in North America. Over 300 tons of cocaine is imported into USA annually. Uh, in human medicine, now in the old times, they were using cocaine as an injectable local anesthetic, but right now, uh, most commonly, it is used as a topical local anesthetic for ear, nose, throat uh, procedures. In veterinary medicine, cocaine doesn't have any therapeutic usage. It is an illegal drug. And remember, it is a class one agent. Uh, cocaine exists in the environment, including US dollar bill. Approximately 75 to 95% of US dollar is contaminated with cocaine. And apparently, interestingly, cocaine has high affinity high binding affinity and capacity to bind to the US dollar. And it stays there for the lifespan of the money, which is usually 12 months. And the highest level of cocaine ever reported on US dollar is 1.4 milligram, uh, based on what I read. Uh, cocaine is extensively metabolized in animals and also in humans. You can maybe see little or no cocaine in urine. Uh, in horses also, the most common, the most abundant metabolite of cocaine is benzyl acne. So this slide summarizes the effects of cocaine in people in terms of performance enhancing drug. Remember, cocaine is a very potent central nervous system stimulant. It increased the energy level, it increased the mental alertness, it also increases the heart rate and blood pressure. Benzylacanine is an excellent biomarker for cocaine exposure because benzylacanine has both positive and negative charge. So what does that mean? It means that regardless of urinary pH, you will have high level of benzylacanine in horse urine. Now, in the literature, it has been shown that if the animals and horses are exposed to little amount of cocaine, that can create a relatively high urinary level of benzyl acanine. Now, when ELISA test was introduced in California in 1988, 12 horses were tested positive for benzyl acanine within 12 months period. All of these horses had urinary level of benzyl acanine less than 30 nanogram per milliliter. Now, a human recreational dose of cocaine is 50 to 100 milligram. And in the literature, they say that if you use one to 200 of this dose, which is 0.2 milligram, they should create a urinary level of benzyl acanine at 20 nanogram. Now, Cocaine exists in the environment, and that is why in human drug testing, there is a screening limit for benzyl acanine, 
which is 150 nanogram per milliliter. And there is a conformation cutoff limit for benzylalkanine in human drug testing at 100 nanogram per milliliter. Any urine samples that have benzylalkanine less than these levels are not reported out forensically. And similarly, number of racing jurisdictions in North America have cutoff limits for benzylalkanine. The first one uh, that adopted this rule was Ohio. Uh, it was done in Ohio in 1999. And interestingly, I do believe that I was involved in this study. We added 40 milligram of cocaine into equine urine, and we left it at room temperature. And cocaine is hydrolyzed to form benzyl aconine. So you need to be extremely careful if you only detect benzyl aconine in horse urine, because this could be due to post-collection contamination. If the cocaine passes through the horse, you should be able to detect other metabolites, including uh, agonine, methyl ester, parahydroxybenzyl aconine, and norcocaine. Nine racing jurisdictions in North America has cutoff limits for benzyl aconine in equine urine. These levels range from 50 nanogram per milliliter to 150 nanogram per milliliter. Currently in Louisiana, we have cutoff limit for benzyl aconine in horse urine at 150 nanogram per milliliter, which is very similar to human drug testing. Uh, I don't think anybody in their right mind you should use cocaine as a local anesthetic. It is not that effective, and we have much better uh, local anesthetic drugs, and as I indicated earlier, it's primarily used for topic, topical local anesthesia. Now, in one of the study, it was shown that Four milligram of cocaine causes transient central nervous system stimulation. And it was also indicated that if you administer one fourth of this dose, uh, which is one milligram, and consider this dose to be highest, no effective dose, in other words, the dose of the drug that doesn't induce any detectable pharmacological effect, this dose will create urinary level of benzyl aconine at 100 nanogram per milliliter. Now, Dr. Rick Sams, in one of the studies, he indicated that you have to administer 100 milligram of cocaine five minutes before the exercise in order to have significant effect on exercise. And as you can imagine, if you give 100 milligram of cocaine intravenously, you are going to have several thousands of nanograms of benzyl aconine in the urine, in equine urine. Now, the dose of the cocaine that induces pharmacological effect is highly variable based on literature review. In one of the study, they said that highest no effective dose of cocaine is 10 milligram administered intravenously. But in another study, they indicated that if you give 200 milligram of cocaine intravenously, this dose didn't have any effect on maximum treadmill exercise intensity but it delays the time to exhaustion by 92 seconds. So the dose is highly variable in terms of the dose of the cocaine that induces detectable pharmacological effect in horses. Now, Dr. Colias Baker, when she was in California, she administered 2.5 milligram of cocaine sublingually to four horses. And in that study, she claimed that this amount of cocaine can be easily transferred from the hands of the cocaine abuser to a horse. And this level of cocaine created benzyl aconine level ranging from 19 to 83 nanogram per milliliter. The urinary level of benzyl aconine is extremely variable among horses. And I will talk about that part later. I was given 15 minutes. I will do my best, OK? Uh, in that study also, Dr. Colias Baker showed that if you administer 50 milligram of cocaine intravenously, it didn't have any detectable effect on the central nervous system and also on the cardiovascular system. So these findings based on human studies and animal studies, 
It seems that urinary level of benzyl alkanine at 100 to 150 nanogram per milliliter and maybe even less is not forensically significant and it could be due to environmental contamination. This is based on the literature river. That is what people are saying. But at the end, I will tell you what I think. Screening study was done in Illinois. 20,000 samples were analyzed. They were only able to find benzyl aconine in 28 samples out of 20,000 samples. And the concentrations were below the cutoff limit, which is 150 nanogram per milliliter in Illinois right now. Now, this study, these studies are important. Now, on the right side, uh, this was done by Dr. Tobin, and I do believe that I was involved in this study. Uh, this is one horse study. We gave cocaine 100 milligram IV. Look at the benzyl aconine level. It is around 9200 nanogram per milliliter. But if you look at the urinary level of cocaine, it is only four nanogram per milliliter. And the lowest level was for norcocaine, and you should be able to see other metabolites such as agonine, methyl ester, and parahydroxybenzyl agonine. Now, these two figures are important. Why they are important? Now, they give 10 milligram of cocaine intravenously to five horses. Look at the urinary level of benzyl agonine. It is extremely variable. What does that tell you? That tells you that the metabolism of cocaine among horses is highly variable, ranging from 200 nanogram per milliliter up to 1200 nanogram per milliliter. And as you can see, time to reach peak benzyl aconine level is also highly variable among horses. In some horses, the peak level occurs within one to two hours. In some horses, it occurs at eight hours following cocaine administration. Similarly, in this one, 2.5 sublingual administration. Look at the size of the error bars. It is very, or standard deviation. That tells you that concentration of benzyl aconine is highly variable among horses. Now, North American Association of Racetrack Veterinarians requests a urinary threshold for benzyl aconine at 150 nanogram per milliliter in urine and limit of detection in blood for benzyl aconine at one nanogram per milliliter. So in conclusion, it seems like urinary level of one to 100 nanogram per milliliter and maybe even less of benzyl aconine in horse urine is not forensically significant and most likely it is due to environmental contamination. But I do strongly believe that further studies are required to establish cutoff limits in order to eliminate environmental contamination of, of horses with cocaine. Why I think this way? Well, first of all, as I indicated earlier, the metabolism of cocaine is extremely variable among horses. The urinary level of benzyl aconine is extremely variable among horses. So that makes it actually challenging to develop a urinary threshold for benzyl aconine. Now, I do strongly believe that uh, because of the differences in terms of metabolism and in terms of urinary level of benzyl aconine, I do strongly believe that the racing jurisdictions that have urinary cutoff limit for benzyl aconine in equine urine should also have cutoff limit for the parent drug cocaine in blood. Why? I do strongly believe that somebody can administer cocaine very close to the race time and the horse might have urinary level of benzyl aconine less than 150 nanogram per milliliter, even though it can have pharmacologically active cocaine in its blood. So I do strongly believe that in order to eliminate the environmental exposure of racehorses uh, to cocaine, uh, there should be also cutoff limit for the parent drug in addition to urinary uh, cutoff limit for benzyl aconine. And maybe we can have more aggressive human drug testing at racetracks. And 
this is my presentation. I would like to thank Louisiana State, uh, State Racing Commission for their generous support for our laboratory. And I will be more than happy to answer any questions or maybe at the end we will have questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dericolou, for that excellent presentation. The next presentation will be by Dr. Ted Schultz. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Ted Schultz. Ted is a toxicologist and an attorney, and he is an expert in this area in human medicine, and he's going to speak about uh, methamphetamine and environmental transfers. Well, we're all scientists, so we're all going to do it our own way, so I'll, I'll talk from up here. Uh, the, uh, let's see. I should let you know, uh, by way of start, I've been out of this field for about 25 years. That sounds a little crazy. I started in toxicology working for Dr. Tobin uh, at the University of Kentucky, and oddly enough, the drug I was working with was cocaine and developing a behavioral model for monitoring the behavioral effects of cocaine, and it turned out to be an operant behavioral model. Uh, in any event, I decided I got the bug to go to law school, and I went to law school. So the last 25 years, I've been involved on the human side of forensic toxicology. And I was fortunate enough to uh, hook, hook up with uh, Dr. Tobin again about six years ago. And coming back into the field, I, I had a couple of, wow, how did this happen? How did, how did we get here? Because, uh, again, the human model is a little bit different. Um, and so just by way of, of review, this is the lab we worked in back in the late 70s when I was there. Uh, and I, I point this out because next to us we had a production racetrack laboratory, uh, and they moved into what was then the old tobacco research lab. They moved into a fancier building and they gave the old building to the racing uh, 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 lab. And of course, as soon as they did that, within days it looked like all the horses had started smoking. You know, this. <laughs> And of course, I remember one day one of the technicians came in and said, you know, besides the smoking, we have this one horse with two positives. I said, what's the other positive? He said, oh, it's caffeine. I said, gee, you know, I've seen smoke horses uh, have a cup of coffee in the morning, but I haven't seen them have a cigarette before the race. Uh, so it turned out the question there was, whose urine is it? You know, and the story is, is the groom had to go, but the horse didn't. So guess whose urine showed up at the lab? The guy who smoked and had the cup of coffee. Um, so again, this was sort of an uh, illustrative of, 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 of the problem of contamination and how long we, we've, we've been aware of it. Uh, but what has exacerbated the situation, because the technology in those days, we were chasing, we were constantly chasing uh, sensitivity to try to find the drugs we knew were being used out there, but just couldn't identify. Again, what happened over time is, you know, we've gone from that kind of Rube Goldberg kind of laboratory apparatus with thin layer chromatography, et cetera, et cetera, you know, to the next big step up was immunoassays uh, to more sophisticated instruments that are, that are illustrated on the right. Uh, and these things have exquisite sensitivity, so the race for sensitivity is over. Um, and so I, I characterize this as kind of like the, the evolution of the instruments. And the instruments themselves are, are, it's not so much the technology, but it really has to do with the things that we all carry around in our pocket. The computational power has, has exponentially improved. So you can do an awful lot of number crunching in a very short period of time uh, that basically got us from the, uh, the, the nanograms per uh, uh, level to now the, 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 the picogram level. Uh, and again, you get an idea of what we're talking about. We're now, we're headed on the verge of going into the parts per trillion, the fentagram level, you know, that, that Milky Way kind of number that, that, was, that was thrown about. So it's not only the uh, uh, instruments that have uh, evolved, um, but I also like to say we also have um, the toxicologists that have evolved. This is the evolution. <laughs> And, and of course, you know, what, what my concern is now, and what we've recognized in the human side is, okay, we're down in the picogram level, but what are we measuring? What, what are we looking at? Um, and so therein, therein, I think, lies uh, the essence of what I want to talk about. Methamphetamine is a good exemplar of the issues that we're talking about, as, as Dr. Tobin summarized with, with that survey of the contaminants that existed in just one, one, one facility. Uh, but historically, we've, all, we've always been sort of limited by the analytical limitations. The LOD is called the limited detection. Uh, and that's the, the maximum reliable sensitivity of the method. And then we have a limit of quantitation. In other words, how good a number do we get? You know, what's the variability ar around the number? And these things were all kind of fixed by the instruments. Uh, so that kept us out of trouble of going into areas that we didn't quite understand what we were looking at. 
but it's based upon a theory. And the theory really is, how do you distinguish the signal from the noise? You know, it's like toning in an FM radio. You know, you get a lot of noise, and all of a sudden you get the channel, and all of a sudden it becomes unclear. And that's what you want with your instruments. You don't want to listen to the background noise, the static. You want to hear the, the, the th and of course, it's all gone to digital now, so that doesn't happen. But the older FM, AM radios, that's, this was it. So it's a signal to noise ratio that's out there. But it's not simply the noise of the instrument. There's noise in the environment. There's other types of noise that are out there. Um, there's the analytical background noise. Uh, there's interfering peaks. This is things that, the, that, that my, my, my toxicology friends in the laboratories are always struggling with. Um, there's carryover. You have a, a heavy, I remember when crack first started showing up in, 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 in the human side of things. We get specimens that were so loaded with benzalecanine that it's like, this can't be a real specimen. This has got to be some poorly constructed quality control specimen. But what happened was the instruments, where you shoot the needle into one specimen, it would go to the next specimen, and, unless the, and even going through a cleaning mechanism, we had a problem of carryover. There would be just such a, a heavy amount of contamination. Uh, and then, of course, now we're dealing with environmental contamination, as illustrated in, in, in the first presentation by Tom. You know, and it's not just on the surface. We have it in the air. You know, people smoke marijuana. People smoke crack. They smoke me uh, methamphetamine. So you've got that issue out there. And then we have water. And then we have food. Listen, at Louisiana and every large uh, teaching university in this country, if they have an environmental sciences department, they will send the kids out with, with, with glass jars and go to whatever, a wastewater treatment facility, a lake, a tributary, and get specimens and come back, and they'll discover how many pharmaceutical compounds they can pick up. I mean, there's methamphetamine. When I first heard about this, it was the first study that came out was maybe 15 years ago that people were finding benzalecanine in the Po River. The Po River runs through Rome and, and ends, ends up in the Adriatic. And I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. What do you mean benzalecanine? Lecanine in the river. Well, they found it in the Hudson River. They found it in, in the, on, on the West Coast, you know, the Snake River. So these things are, are ubiquitous part of our environment out there right now. And that is what I call the background noise. How do we distinguish between the noise and, and what, what we're saying is our signal? And again, in, in, on the human side of it, this thing has, this poppy seed has been, has really always been problematic. Because people, maybe horses don't eat a lot of poppy seeds, but people eat a lot of poppy seeds. And a tremendous amount of tonnage. I remember talking to the uh, general counsel of Kraft, uh, 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 the company, they import tons of, of, of poppy seeds. And what you find in the poppy seeds, they're all variable uh, in terms of how much morphine is in it. It's not just the morphine, there's Thebane. And it now, uh, I was talking to Tom earlier, uh, Johnson & Johnson has developed a variety of poppy seeds that push out a lot of codeine now. Uh, because again, it saves them on the manufacturing side. And of course, the main cash product for, for, for poppy seeds is not the morphine, it's Thebane. And this country buys most of the Theban produced in the world because that's the starting product for all your pain pills. That's your oxycodones, your oxymorphones, your hydromorphones. And I think hydromorphone now is the second uh, most abused drug, even though, quote, it's not necessarily illegal all the time. In fact, most of it is legal. Um, so, that, so that's how that's evolved. But the question that came up on the federal side was, how are we going to have a program that's going to get through the Supreme Court uh, if we can't distinguish eating a bagel from IVing a heroin? Uh, so, that, that, uh, so that was one of the issues, uh, the safeguards that were built into the program. And of course, the same thing goes for the, the environmental thing. You know, in order for the federal program to work, it has to be able to rule out environmental exposure. And for example, this is a study that was done relatively recently, and this is a study that was coincidentally done by one of our colleagues at the UK back when I was working in Dr. Tobin's office. This fellow's name is Ed Cohn. He's done most of the research with, with human addiction medicine uh, that, that's been published. He's got hundreds of publications, and he built this little chamber at uh, John Hopkins, you know, and it, you can't see it very well, but it's a plastic chamber. They put a whole bunch of people in there and just blew marijuana smoke through there. So they had people who were actively smoking and a couple of people that weren't smoking. Everybody seemed to be happy, but in any event. <laughs> but the idea was to demonstrate how, how, how intense the environmental contamination had to be for it to start showing up in, in urine specimens. If you had a, this as a casual kind of issue, uh, the program would become a litigation program. It really, wouldn't, it really would, grind, would grind to a halt. Now, getting to the methamphetamine thing, there are a couple of issues. First of all, methamphetamine, like cocaine, is, is somewhat ubiquitous. Matter of fact, I saw a fun study done after, you know, you have these concerts, Burning Man concert or some, some musical concert, and, and of course the, the kids are out there with their bottles, the environmentalists are out there taking samples, and you see a huge surge of methamphetamine after the concert, along with MDMA, along with some of the ecstasy uh, kind of designer drugs show up in those tributaries, you know, after the concert. Now, I guess if you had a horse out there pasturing and drinking some of that, well, you may have problems with that. Um, but in any event, the, method, the other interesting thing with methamphetamine is it comes in two forms. 
It's this thing that drove me crazy in organic chemistry. But there's a, there's a D and an L form. Uh, it's like your right and your left hand. The D form I call the right hand. The L form is the left hand. The right hand is centrally active. This is the one that everyone wants to give. This is the one that gives you the big bang for your buck. The left hand is more of a decongestant. It works more peripheral. It's a vasoconstrictor. And the difference is that this left form, which in a mass spectrometer looks just like the right form, basically is found in Vicks inhaler. So we've got that issue. And, and I've always felt that that was a deficiency in the federal program. If they can't distinguish between an over-the-counter drug, it's back to the issue with like the poppy seeds between is it a bagel or is it, is, is, is it abuse? It's a little bit more complicated than that. But again, there's a way of doing these DNL isomer identifications that I think are prerequisite. And now it's being required or being, being authorized in the federal program to do this. And of course, we have the dermal transfer issue. I mean, every, if you look at uh, some data that comes out of the social services of, of states like Washington, uh, where a lot of meth labs are, you find all the kids that are in family services, they're all positive for methamphetamine if they come from a family near or in a place that cooks meth. Uh, and then, of course, we had this famous paper a couple of years ago where we had a trailer that was up in Canada that looked like it had been one, the, what I call the Breaking Bad trailer. I mean, someone was cooking meth in that trailer for a while. And, and when they put horses in there, guess what? Every horse that was in there, you know, came up positive for methamphetamine. So, uh, and then of course we had this, the, the, well, the first case I got involved with back on, on the equine side of toxicology uh, was this bourbon warfare case. And then when, when the attorney uh, sent me the, 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 the laboratory data, I'm going, 57 picograms? What, are you kidding me? I mean, again, that, that's sort of like Hudson River levels. I mean, really, relatively low. So the idea was, how did we get here? How did, how did this sort of, you know, it's like chasing the rabbit hole, uh, go, going down the rabbit hole. And, you know, I understand it from a laboratory perspective. I mean, I'm the same way. You know, you get a fancy instrument, it's sexy, it does things more it's easier. It's, you know, it's all software driven, that kind of stuff. Oh, you know, like, other than the cost, it's everyone's gonna, we're gonna get those instruments. And you're gonna have, you know, and you're gonna have more positives. So again, you've got another, um, uh, uh, this is a Canadian st uh, story I was talking to you about with, with, with the trailer. Uh, again, this is published in a peer reviewed journal. So we've got that out there. And then, of course, the baking bread. And again, this is, I think there's a growing awareness of, of environmental contamination out there because it's well established that most of, most of the paper circulation, uh, so we've known it for, for a dozen years or 20 years now, that has benzylecanine. But there's more and more of the paper that, guess what, now also has the methamphetamine. Now, again, I don't think the horses are eating the dollar bills out of the groom's pocket. You know, I don't, I'm not so sure that's the, the whole source of it. But just sort of give you the idea that this has become part of the environment, part of the, the universe that, that we live in. Um, and, uh, and, and again, we've got the issue where somebody who is, who, is, who is a drug user, maybe it's a legal drug, maybe it's an illegal drug, if they're going to take a whiz in the stall on, on, on the hay, well, guess who's going to eat the hay? You know, and then you, you've, you've got that source of, of, of uh, uh, and this is a tramadol. And one of the things we found with tramadol, you know, tramadol was like the, you know, we had this terrible opiate epidemic in this country that I've been really watching for the last dozen years or so. And it's really horrific. Uh, but, you know, one of the drugs that came out was the alternative to these other drugs was tramadol. Well, tramadol is a weak painkiller, but people on this thing ramp it up. They, they ramp it up, and the, the levels of tramadol you find in human urine are shocking. You know, again, it's like that when, when they started smoking crack. You know, these numbers are like, you know, hundreds of thousands of nanograms. So, you know, you have somebody who's ramped up on tramadol and takes a whiz in the stall. I'm, I'm, I'll bet you two to one that's what you're going to find in, in, in the horse. And one of my favorite little ones, just esoteric kind of things, that this is a guy that's got uh, a, a, a test um, where you've got uh, sinophidil, you know, a uh, Rogaine. So, you know, the, the owner's got Rogaine. And of course, sinophidil is, can be a performance drug, but that's apparently the better source was it was the guy's uh, hairspray. Uh, and of course, we've already talked about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So just wanted to point out one thing, the difference between human and, and equine testing right now. And one of the things I've been very involved on, on the development of the human regulations, and one of the things I, I learned very early on, I worked for one of the laboratories, that was one of the first certified labs in the lab that was doing the testing for the military, uh, was, look, we can have a choice here. Do we want a litigation program or do we want to have a testing program? So my view has always been, get the, get the litigatable issues out of here. Don't deal with those. Figure out a way of fixing them. Don't make believe they don't exist. Don't try to cover them up because the word will get out and next thing you know, we're going to be up to our elbows in, 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 in cases. And the reason we don't see this on the human side, at least on, on the federally mandated, is that all the mandated testing that the federal government requires is a search. You know, you don't think of it as a search, but the, every court that's looked at it says, when the government says thou shalt test, that's a search. And because it's a search, 
All the testing that you see, all the Department of Transportation, all the pilots, all the truck drivers, that testing is done as an exception to the Fourth Amendment prohibition on doing drug tests. Now, the significance of that is that the Supreme Court laid out some conditions. In order to fit into that exception, would, for, for otherwise a constitutional prohibition, you had to basically have rigorous, rigorous laboratory accreditation and inspection program. Congress turned around and started HHS and said, you shall, thou shalt develop a, a bulletproof program. And they did, the NLCP, National Lab Certification Program. Um, and you can't have any false positives. Uh, and then we also have the thing that I've spent most of my time with in my real world are medical review officers. MRO re MROs are physicians who get all the laboratory results at the front end and then talk to the donor and determine whether or not they have what's called a, an alternative medical explanation or not. Uh, and again, that, uh, so for, for 20 years or so, I've been doing the training and certification of the physicians doing that, doing that function. And of course, part of the success of the program, and it hasn't been, if you think of how many millions of urine specimens on the human side that have been, have been collected and tested and reported, and, and then the reports are significant. And if you're an airline pilot, you're gonna be out of a job. If you're a police officer, you're gonna be unemployed if your, drug, if your urine test comes up positive. And, and I'll tell you something, pilots and police officers, they don't roll over, they lawyer up, and they go to the mats on these things. So part of the way of getting that thing to be successful was to establish clear and convincing cutoff levels. And that's why it takes so long even to update the program. They don't want to have any source of controversy. They want things as black and white as possible. Uh, and of course, that's all part of the due process uh, uh, split specimen things. And of course, forensics has got all kinds of different areas. You know, we, we talk about identifying the cause of death. Every tox lab, a criminal tox lab, or any medical examiner's office is backed up these days from the overwhelming number of deaths we've seen from, from opioid abuse. Uh, and of course, now the drug is not no longer, you know, the, the hydrocodone, the oxycodone, but the fentanyls. And, and, and the other thing, the upside to having these really sensitive instruments is we're going to need them. Because what's happening now is we're moving from the traditional drugs we're all kind of familiar with to a whole new class of, of novel or new uh, psychotropic uh, 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 medications. For example, in my lab in, in, in medical examiner's office in North Carolina, uh, they've identified 40 new fentanyls that aren't even in the books yet but they show up with, you know, with the cadavers uh, for the, the post-mortems. Uh, and then we have the study and causes of identification. But even in these situations, for example, even the medical examiner's office, if they just find a low level of something that has nothing to do with the cause of death, they just don't report it out. They just, they're looking for, again, a, a, diff a different thing, you know, whether or not, not the person was addicted, but what, what caused their death. And uh, uh, so again, we've moved this. So, uh, so the question I come back to, or I, or I wanted to start with, is you know this is from Alice in Wonderland, which oftentimes I feel I'm in, uh, and that is you know Alice asks the cat, uh, which road should I take? And the cat asks Alice, well, where do you want to go? I said I don't, I don't care. I said well, it doesn't matter. So that's the issue. I think that's the threshold issue. I think that the the racing industry has to ask itself, where do we want to go? You know, and, and then at that point, how and how, how are we going to get there? Um, and again, the things I think that need to be done to enhance the program, and I hate beating up the labs because I know how hard it is. I've been in the lab side. I'm still in the, to some degree in the lab side. So it's very difficult to just, you know, I, I know there are a lot of pressure. It's a very difficult way to, to, to you know, with, with volumes. And if you don't have a lot of positives, then it's said, oh, you don't need the program anymore, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things, uh, the, three, the three things I think that the industry needs to think about is, you know, screening the workers, not to terminate them. I mean, that's not it, but just to see who is at risk for containment contamination, who's a, who's a point source for contamination. Um, the swiping environmental study of the, of the uh, of surroundings and, uh, and checking the feeds in the water. I mean, those are the kind of things I think that, you know, I think maybe the labs should start thinking about doing proactively. Again, with the view to get these issues out of here, demonstrate that the levels that they're testing at is, is not going to be a source of environmental contamination, other than the anecdotal stuff. Because I, the anecdotal stuff, I can take it or leave it. I understand it's all well-meaning, but there you show me the data. Show me the science is where I'm at. Because I tell you, for all my years in this business, one of the books I haven't written but I should write is The Myths and Mythology of Toxicologists, because there have been a lot of them. And again, I don't want to criticize them because they're, they're as smarter than I am, but at the same time, they've been wrong often as, as well, well-meaning. Well so the idea is show me the data on this. And the other thing I think is really needed in this area is independent laboratory accreditation. 
Um, you know, I was involved with a case uh, last year with the USEF, not in the racing industry, but, you know, the show jumping, you know, kind of accreditation, equestrian foundation. And I didn't realize when I got into the case that they own the laboratory. So they're the prosecutor, they're the, they're, they're, the, they're, the, they're the regulator, and they also have a vested interest in the lab. That's an intrinsic conflict of interest to me. Uh, and it turned out that, that they, they, they basically got beat up by that. Uh, and I think had a lot of liability exposure, but I think that the, that case has gone away. So in any event, those are my two cents on all of this. And again, it's been a privilege for me to be here with you guys. And I'll turn it back over to Tom. Thank you very much, Ted, for that excellent, for that excellent presentation. Uh, next speaker up is Dr. Clara Feger, and she's going to speak about dext dextrorphan, dextromethorphan identifications in Kentucky. Uh, thank you. I'm going to really zip through this because I don't want to cut into Hugh's time and we're running over, I think. Um, the, the, uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to, we're going to get off of the illegal drugs and onto like normal, typical prescription drugs. Dextromethorphan, which I spelled wrong in the slides, apologize, is a cough suppressant. It's present in many over-the-counter cold remedies. One of the issues with this is Dextromethorphan can be used as a drug of abuse. Now, uh, Ted discussed like what drug levels mean, parts per billion, parts per trillion. Um, the, the presence of these drugs in the bloodstream of an abuser is in the parts per million. This is in the blood. It, the therapeutic levels are in the parts per billion. And when I, I see here people coughing, you need some NyQuil, maybe some Robitussin. Um, your drug levels are going to be in the parts per billion. Um, and we certainly are capable, our drug testing, of testing to the parts per trillion. Uh, the, all of the drugs, be they abuse, drugs of abuse, of human recreational substances, all of the drugs or actual therapeutic medications can pretty much fall into two general categories. One category is the effect in the animal or the person is directly driven by the level in the blood. So in order to have a therapeutic effect, the Robitussin stops you from coughing. Parts per billion in the blood has to be there. If it gets into the parts per trillion really low, it's not having any effect. And then there's a other general broad classification of drugs where the effect, hap the effect, you give the drug and then the effect happens either spatially or temporally distant to where the drug is given. And the classic example is erythropoietin. You give EPO, three weeks later you have a high red cell count, no erythropoietin to be found. Another example is uh, lidocaine, mepivacaine, novocaine, where you inject it locally into your teeth to have tooth work done, but the blood level does not reflect what's being done in your mouth. No, it doesn't have any effect. So that's just to keep that in mind. Uh, there's two general categories. Almost everything we've talked about here today falls into the former category. It's got to be there in blood making an effect, doing something, binding to a receptor in the body, and it's related, directly related to the blood concentration. Many of the substances we talked about today, including dextromethorphan, are drugs that are being called somewhat routinely as identifications in urine only, meaning they're not finding it in blood at any concentration, they're only finding it in urine, and as a consequence of that, Horsemen are being penalized. Horse owners are being penalized by disqualifications because we are simply saying it was in the urine. That means at some point it was in the horse. At some point it was in the horse. Therefore, it's a violation. An example of how ubiquitous some of these substances can be, dextromethorphan and its metabolites have been found in the South Platte River which is where the effluent from the water treatment plant for Denver is discharged. So they, they have as many as a kilogram per day of dextromethorphan and its metabolites passing down the South Platte River in, in the months of, 
of uh, in the winter months when you would expect a lot of NyQuil to be to be consumed. So obviously this is a, a environmental contamination very clearly and also very stable in the environment because they can be identified in the river. So there have been recent identifications. I'm going to quickly go through these. There was a, one in New Jersey where the commission gave a suspension of fine and a disqualification. When it went to the administrative law judge, they, the administrative law judge found that it was likely a contamination, but that the regulations of the racing commission prohibited her from completely rescinding the positive test. And so she had to uphold a small fine and also the disqualification. In Maryland, the commission agreed that there was environmental contamination, and they awarded no disqualification, no fine, no suspension, and they, but they did award minimum medication points. In Kentucky, the horse was disqualified, and trainer, trainer penalties were assessed by the stewards, and this went on for a year. About a year later, the, the penalties were rescinded, completely rescinded, fine, disqualification, everything, based on what they considered to be new research. I'm going to really quickly go through what the new research is. So dextromethorphan is on your far left. And dextromethorphan is in the horse. It, it happens in people as well. But in horses are really, really good at, and effective at doing this. It's rapidly converted to O-desmethyl. So there's your O at the top. And desmethyl means they, the enzyme, the, the CYD, or it's actually CYP, CYP2D50 enzyme, takes the methyl away. So there's the methyl. There it's gone. That's O-desmethyl dextromethorphan, or, or known as dextrorphan. And then additionally, a different enzyme in the liver very rapidly adds a glucuronide. And the glucuronide, this is the, the body's a, attempt to get rid of it. So the O-desmethyl or the dextrorphan actually has pharmacologic activity, but the glucuronide does not. So that makes it soluble in water, and that makes it so that the body can rapidly eliminate it by, by urination. So they urinate it out. So this new research demonstrates that this version of SIP 2D50, there, there's, uh, there's several different versions or uh, the, depending on the genetics of the animal, they could have a different one that is highly variable. And this variability can categorize the horses as being poor, extensive, or ultra-rapid metabolizers. And the result, my take from reading the, the uh, what, what has come out about this decision in Kentucky is that the variability is the basis for the rescission of the penalty because some individual horses may excrete it rapidly and some may have it present for a long, long time. And, and because of that, the high variance, it, it makes it patently unfair that one horse is exposed and has a, a level for a long time and a different horse is exposed and has a level for a very short time. And the significance of this is the CYP2D50 enzyme is responsible for metabolizing a lot of different things. And there's three common ones that we see over and over as positives across the country. Very low levels, always in urine, of, and, of dextrorphan, O-desmethyltramadol, ODMT, and O-desmethylvenlafaxine. And the key thing amongst all of these is very low or non-existent levels in the blood. These are all substances that do what I initially talked about. They got to be there in blood to have an effect. And so they're very low concentrations, likely exposure in these horses in the receiving barn. Uh, there's a, case, a series of cases in Illinois in standard breads where the stall that every positive horse raced out of, the paddock, the way standard breads race, they go to a central paddock and then go out to race, that the paddock judge was urinating in the stall and the paddock judge was on tramadol and every positive horse raced out of that stall. So somehow, just from having the equipment laying up against the side of the stall in the paddock, 
and then being put on the horse, ended up with all of these horses having tramadol. Again, low level ODMT in urine, nothing identified in blood. So the point being horsemen, commissioners, RCI, uh, TOBA members, anybody who's a member of any organization that's a member of the RMPC, it's critical that we start to differentiate and that these trace urinary concentration of substances such as dextorphan that are not associated with a significant amount in, in the blood clearly don't have an effect that we need to start considering an environmental contamination separate violation category so that we can start to separate these environmental contaminants from, you know, real attempts to, to cheat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fanger. Uh, I'm going to speak a few words about Tramadol, just pick it up, and then um, you want to introduce you now? Go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead. I'll just stay until you. I beg your pardon? Tramadol, Scott. Just a few words on Tramadol, uh, the identifications, and then we'll have Hugh, and then we'll have question and answer. Uh, pointer, perhaps? Somebody have the pointer? Tramadol is a human prescription medication occasionally identified in post-race urines. Uh, the first thing about tra Tramadol is it's a much less potent opioid type medication. The dose is 400 milligrams per day to a human. It's at least a tenth of the potency of morphine. We have a problem with Tramadol because, as Dr. Feger pointed out, it's rapidly metabolized, inactivated, and excreted an essentially pharmacologically inactive form in the horse. Uh, trace level identifications of tramadol on horses occur associated with inadvertent transfer from humans. Uh, we had a number in Kentucky, and uh, basically the traders were penalized. More recently, the British Horse Racing Association has recognized trace level tramadol identifications in race horses associated with inadvertent transfer from human prescription users. And in fact, the first uh, trainer identified was from the same county in Ireland that I grew up in, Tipperary, and um, he noted that it was very expensive to uh, urinate in a horse stall. That was his circumstance. Since Tramadol is less potent, now, this is the serious take-home message here. There's an international cutoff for morphine in urine of 30 nanograms per mL. And in fact, in, uh, in the early, uh, about 2004, the British Horse Racing Association put in an in-house threshold of 50 nanograms per bell. They just weren't going to touch anything below 50. Uh, recently, there's one of 30, and there are a number of cutoffs in various states around the country that uh, are run from 50 on up. Since tramadol is a less potent medication than morphine, must less potent, tramadol should presumably never be called at concentrations less than the cutoffs for morphine because it's a less potent medication, much less likely to have any possibility of affecting a horse. Um, it's, in fact, it may be considered a prodrug because it's not active as tramadol, it's active after the first metabolism step to odesmethyltramadol. When you take a tramadol tablet, it doesn't, you absorb it, the liver converts it to the O, takes the methyl group off, makes O does methyl tramadol. That is what gives you the pharmacological effect. So it's not, it's not even a drug itself. And in the horse, this happens very rapidly and it's very rapidly eliminated, essentially ineffective because it's so rapidly metabolized. And here we have some data that comes out of Dr. Stanley's group in California 
showing uh, uh, the free drug in the blue, the conjugated form, and what we don't have in there is the level of the pharmacologically active form. Uh, concentrations in urine drop rapidly, and then they hang around at low concentrations between here, here we're looking at probably, that's 100, so that would be about 20 nanograms per ml, so we're looking at 5 to 20 nanograms per ml, trace levels long after administration of a pharmacologically inactive substance in a horse. What is the pharmacological significance of these identifications? Uh, essentially zero. Uh, we have, the, I told you that the first trainer identified, uh, who was identified as transferring tramadol from him to his horse was uh, an Irish gentleman. There have been a number since, and quite a number of investigations in England, and they have concluded that if you are a human and you're on a prescription, a prescription of tramadol, it's likely to inadvertently transfer at small concentrations to the horse. Now, if you want to look at the score, <laughs> the number of tramadol identifications worldwide, and I've got some of them here. Here are some of the, uh, I'm looking for my, here are some of the Engl recent English ones, 2006, 2016, 16, 16. This is the first one where they, uh, Tracy from Tipperary, where the first one where they identified it as transfer from a human in 15. We have a, this one in Oregon was quite unusual, and I, I won't go into it here because basically it, it turned out that it was in one sample and not in the other, and Mary Ann alerted me to that. And then if we go back in the United States, we have a large number of tramadol identifications. And to give you an idea of um, the concern about tramadol, out I want, we had a trauma, there was a tramadol identification in Indiana racing, and Indiana racing is not known to be easy on trainers, but on this particular trainer, they petitioned the, AR, the ARCI to reduce the penalty on the classification of tramadol because they were convinced it was uh, an innocent transfer. The source of the transfer was never identified. So summary. It's less potent opioid than morphine, much less potent. It's inactive, it's rapidly metabolized and excreted in the urine. It's highly concentrated in the urine. That's a point I need to emphasize, which is why a trace level transferring from a human is detectable in horse urine. And the British Horse Racing Association has officially recognized tramadol identifications associated with human exposure. And I would find it very difficult to justify any call for tramadol of less than 30 nanograms per mil, because that is the, the worldwide base level cutoff for morphine in horses. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Nick. We're going to switch gears a little bit now. Um, everyone you've heard from previously were scientists, uh, establishing that obviously environmental contamination is an issue. Uh, next up is Hugh Gallagher. Hugh is a longtime regulator. Uh, met him many years ago when he was vice chairman of the ARCI Model Rules Committee. And Hugh is a very well-reasoned, reasonable regulator. He works with Rope now. He was the, actually Naira is his, his employer, uh, first safety steward with Naira and is, works extensively with Rope. Um, so here's a regulator's perspective on environmental contamination. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Not a problem. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you. A um, bit overwhelmed with all the scientists and all the science, but that happens in stewards' hearings, especially in medication cases. And we get them. We get them with more frequency. Um, but we handle a lot of things. We handle discipline problems. Most of it is racing. Uh, it all goes back to racing. And the medication we have to keep in mind goes back to racing. That's what it's all about. So uh, let me see if I can work this uh, properly environmental transfer, the regulatory perspective. So I've got some advice to stewards. Some of it goes way back. There's a fragment from Heraclitus. That's a uh, pre-Socratic philosopher. It says, you cannot step twice into the same river for other waters are ever flowing onto you. Now keep that in mind. Uh, there was a California steward that Scott Stanley's familiar with. Peterson on medication of the horse said, encourage research. 
Study the matter and have an open mind. And that's good sound advice for every issue for a steward. So more advice, unless you expect the unexpected, you will not find it, for it's hidden and thickly tangled. And then along with Peterson's advice, number four in our rope resource guide, which I strongly recommend all of you getting a copy of, not a sales pitch, but it's certainly a valuable uh, tool for racing. There's uh, uh, quite a bit of information in there. It gives you great regulatory insight. <clears throat> there are limitations to the expert. Concentrate as an official on what you do not know, not on what you do know. Give that some thought. So stewards, where we come in, following what uh, our experts, uh, our scientists have told us today, there's a great deal to digest. And where we come in usually is with a lab report. Each jurisdiction is different. Every jur I've worked in 10 different jurisdictions, and the setup is different for each one. <clears throat> some, uh, you'll get a letter, some you'll get a phone call but you will get a laboratory report telling you that there's a finding. So you get that and um, the lab report will give you what the uh, substance that was found. Uh, and uh, usually it's not uh, quantitative unless it is a quantitative substance. <clears throat> now if you have something like, um, if you're testing for uh, base excess, you may get a report on that. If you don't use a radiometer at the track uh, and your testing is done on the scene in a, as we have at Naira, an assembly barn. But that is actually a, uh, a sampling area. Most places are, are not actually called what they are. We don't have a whole lot of test facilities at racetracks. We have sampling facilities, but not testing facilities. The testing actually is done in laboratories like the Maddie Lab and many other laboratories throughout the country. So what we do is sample at racetracks. So when a lab report's received by the stewards, due process is on the clock, and that's the key to it all. Due process fundamentally is fairness. And it should be the creed of every steward, or in the case of harness racing judge, that a licensee is allowed an opportunity to get a fair and impartial hearing. And there are certain things that are in place. They're in place in our uh, resource guide, and they're in place in rule books throughout the country, and in Canada, as well as in the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean members of RCI as well. Uh, the stewards' hearings are either informal or formal, and they depend on each individual jurisdiction's rules and regs. Now, in the case of medication, not just the post-race, but in, case of, in cases of all medication, they're, they're going to be formal because of consequences. These are serious, particularly in this day and age with multiple medication violations. It's the points that are adding up. In New York, where I'm working, uh, sometimes uh, if we get a report of an overage, the first question a trainer would have for me, how many points does come, comes along with that? They're not as concerned about the consequences of a fine or what suspensions with it, but what points does it carry? Is it a half point? Is it one? What are the points? And that, that is really, uh, it's really taken hold in the uh, training community and it impacts their livelihood because owners are aware of MMV now as well. So the fundamental tenets of due process are notice. And what notice should contain is the name and license number of each licensee, the time, place, and date of the hearing, the reason for the hearing, <clears throat> and it always should be a possible violation. You shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't say for a violation of X, uh, cite the rule and rules in question. This goes back to keeping an open mind. Uh, quote from the rule or the enabling statute of that jurisdiction that authorizes the stewards, racing officials, to conduct hearings in the first place. There has to be authority to do that. The fundamental rights of the licensee, you have a right to a lawyer, counsel, or advocate. Certainly, as the uh, attorneys mentioned yesterday in the afternoon session, 
Uh, if you do have a notice that there is a medication, a potential medication violation or concern, it is very wise and prudent to contact an attorney or the member, uh, a member of your HBPA, for sure, at, the, at least that. Uh, uh, other rights that you have, you have the right to produce witnesses in your behalf. You start building a case, what happened? Go back and retrace your steps days before you entered the horse. What happened? Who was around the barn? What took place? Uh, was, uh, what vet work was done? Get your records in order. Present evidence on your behalf, and that is the records that I just mentioned. Get everything in line. Get, get it in an orderly fashion so that when you do get to the hearing, you're organized and ready to move in a forward direction. Of course, if you do have counsel, an advocate, or a representative, they'll help you along with this. And you certainly have a right to cross-examine any and all testimony and or evidence brought against you, and that's critical. And uh, I, I, I'll say at this point that if you encounter a stand or an office of stewards and or judges and you don't find that these things are happening, I think that you have a right and an obligation to go higher to the Racing Commission and let them know that you don't think that your rights were uh, made possible to you. It's critical that we have justice in racing. Who receives the notice of hearing? In the case of medication and in racing, all affected parties uh, to the race. So uh, if, if, if any shall, if there is a race, uh, I put that in in case of a walkover. If any shall receive notice, that would be owners, trainers, and jockeys in the, in the case that it is uh, something that takes place actually on the track. The assessment factors. This is very important. It doesn't say much here, but it, it, uh, it, there's a lot in the, the words here. Mitigating factors must be considered. We're taught that by uh, our lawyers. Our school to be accredited as a steward or a judge, it's eight days uh, at either the University of Arizona or at the uh, University of Louisville, and one entire day is on law. And uh, the mitigating factors aspect of it uh, must be considered. Uh, mitigating factors can be many, many things. Uh, some of those elements were brought up here today. Uh, what happens in stalls? Uh, what happens with employees? Uh, byproducts, those things are critical. Aggravating factors may be considered. It's not must, they may be considered. And what I mean by considered is after the fact, not during the hearing, but after the fact. That's, that's when you consider those, after the fact. Stewards and judges should be keeping a tally sheet. They should also be asking questions of things that they don't understand during hearings, particularly of expert witnesses, of Dr. Stanley, Dr. Tobin, Dr. Finger, any of the experts at the table uh, here at the dais were to be testifying on the behalf of a licensee, a trainer, an owner, anyone that happened to be uh, testifying, uh, and you don't understand something, it's incumbent upon that particular racing official to ask a question to have a better understanding, rather than to go off with a murky understanding and to draw a murky conclusion. So again, let's go through that. Mitigating factors must be considered. You have to consider those. Aggravating factors may be considered. Environmental contaminants and substances of human use. That seems to be uh, increasing. We're seeing more of that rather than less. Uh, the environment is rife with uh, elements that uh, can get into racing. And substances of human use, well, there's more human use of uh, substances, both prescribed and non-prescribed. So um, what do we do as an industry to keep this out of the stalls of our most precious product, our lifeblood, our horses? How do we, what do we do about that? How can we stop it, if at all? So the RCI... <clears throat> 01.20, Medication and Prohibited Substances, Section 1, Environmental and Substances in Human Use, uh, point 4 says, if the preponderance of evidence presented in a hearing 
shows environmental contamination or inadvertent exposure to human drug use, it should be considered a mitigating factor. So that's an example of a mitigating factor. If the preponderance of evidence presented in a hearing shows environmental contamination or inadvertent exposure to human drug use, it should be considered a mitigating factor. Okay, that's right out of the uh, model rules. Preventative actions. <clears throat> so for trainers, uh, just a bit of advice, keep your barn EC. Uh, that's an, an uh, environmentally contaminant free stalls are not bathrooms. I think you can uh, educate your new com incoming uh, employees of that and you can trainers can talk to assistant trainers to foremen right down the line uh, to uh, grooms, hot walkers, uh, your whole staff you can, you can let that be known. Keep coffee, that's caffeine, tea is caffeine, energy drinks contain Guarana, other substances, uh, high-powered, uh, uh, high-potency drinks, uh, chocolate, whether you know it or not, has theobromine in it that can uh, ring a bell in a lab, particularly these highly sensitive uh, LCMS, GCMS labs. Uh, they dial up a number, stick it in there, boom, you're going to see a result. So they will, uh, they will get responses. For regulators, keep sampling areas uh, hygienic. Certainly, uh, I know recently, by recently I mean in the last 18 months, I know of at least one jurisdiction that did uh, test uh, its employees because of the involvement of uh, two uh, human, uh, let's say drugs of human choice that would be used uh, in a human way. I think they were methamphetamine based uh, and they were in the mid-Atlantic so the commission uh, prudently tested all of those uh, uh, people that were working in that particular, as I call it, sampling area and uh, those uh, results have not been released. So regularly test employees, regularly sanitize the sample stalls. I think that's critical that that, be, that, uh, that takes place. I think they need to be cleaned out and they need to be limed and they need to be sanitized as much as possible. And that, that's, that's an obligation, um, a minimal obligation. So unless you expect the unexpected, you'll not find it for it's hidden and thickly tangled. All right. That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Okay. We'll open it up to questions in just a moment, but um, I wanted to make one point. In Levant's presentation on benzalectinine, I think he had nine states that showed published screening limits. So the question in my mind is, what, what if I'm in a state that doesn't have a published screening limit? Does that mean I'm at major risk for environmental contamination at a very low level? I think the answer is maybe. And the reason I say maybe, there are many labs, maybe even the majority of labs, that may not have a published screening limit for benzalectinine, for methamphetamines, for a lot of the other medications or drugs that we've talked about, but they have an internal screening limit. And I'm not sure that one is preferable to the other um, as long as there's a limit in place and it's high enough that we don't have an environmental transfer or environmental contamination issue, it's probably okay. The problem being, you just don't know. Uh, you don't know if it's not published, but you can probably go back and look at the number of positives for these medications over the last five years, and if it's one or two, you probably have a lab that has an internal screening limit. And I guess I'll kick off the questions and without asking what the internal screening limit may be to Dr. Stanley, do you have internal screening limits for benzalectinine, morphine, and other environmental contaminants, that some of the other drugs we've talked about today? Um, one of the things that, uh, that we heard repeatedly 
in the presentations today was a discussion about environmental contamination. And uh, there seemed to be a lot of overlap with the use of environmental contamination and what the RCI regulation also refers to because they specifically say environmental contamination or exposure to human drugs of abuse. And I think it's a clear distinction that needs to be made that the environmental contamination that I generally speak of would be that of a feed contamination, uh, something that became part of the horse's uh, consumption in, in a daily feed, um, potentially a vitamin or a supplement as well that got put into there unbeknownst to the trainer. The human drugs of abuse that re result in exposures to horses, uh, therapeutic drugs that revol result in exposures to horses, uh, considered to be a different set of circumstances than environmental contamination. How they got into the horse's stall, whether the groom or trainer or someone uh, provided that through urine exposure, certainly does put that in the horse's stall, but they're not the same as that that uh, a horse is being fed because the feed was contaminated at the time that they were consuming that. Can I just comment on that? The rub with that is that there's no instrument that I know of that can tell you where the drug came from. It can't tell you if it came from the wall, from the feed, or from a, or from a human. A couple of years ago, I was involved with a, with a big class action suit involving a compound called ethyl glucuronide. This is a metabolite of alcohol that's used to monitor people in abstinence programs. And this got into the Wall Street Journal. There was a whole series of these cases. And the cases were against the laboratories because it turns out that ethyl glucuronide, well, it turns out that alcohol is an environmental contaminant. I mean, think about a rotten, an apple, a banana, soy sauce. I mean, it's all over the environment. The question with that was not is it there, but how much? And the issue that I talked about from the laboratory's perspective is that you, how are you going to sue the laboratory? The laboratory said it would identify ethyl glucuronide, but at the same time, it didn't say it would tell you where it came from. So where it comes from, I don't think makes a difference. If it isn't something that was administered, uh, and then and there, and there may not be a good answer to that, how do you determine where it was, if it was administered or not? That's what I think the operative issue is. I, I'm making a distinction between is it in, you know, from the food or from the hands of the trainer, I don't see that 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 is you know something that can be delineated. Uh, Ted, I can respond to that pretty simply. Um, things like ractopamine, zopaterol, uh, clenbuterol are not human medications for abuse uh, <clears throat> or for advancement. There are a small percent of maybe bodybuilders that might use clenbuterol. It is not a popular drug. It is not a prescribed drug. It's not found in a human exposure. It's not a recreational drug. So the drugs that I'm talking about with the exception of something like morphine that can be found in um, natural products, uh, we don't see cocaine, methamphetamine, those human drugs of abuse as contaminants to feeds. So if we have a rash of zolpaterol positives, which is a case that happened in California because of, of exposure that came through molasses that was mix, mixed into sweet feed, we were able to backtrack that back, identify the molasses as the source, and trace that back to when it, ha when it occurred, the date that it occurred, and the exposure. I do believe that a lot of this can be done uh, with better investigation, with the effort by the Racing Commission, by the Department of Agriculture, uh, with help from the, uh, the trainers and the people on the grounds, that we can figure out a lot of that. In the cases of human exposures from uh, a drug abuser, you're going to get a lot less valuable information in investigating and talking to those individuals. But I disagree with you. I actually think that in many of the cases, maybe not all, but in many of the cases, we can determine whether it's a source of human drug exposure or whether it's a source of feed contamination. I'll let that go. I, I, I'm just going to comment about that just simply that we have a number of examples. That's not we, we have a number of examples where horses have been likely to be contaminated as a result of the investigation, as a result of handling of the animal after it loses, uh, uh, when it's not under the control of the trainer. So for example, the tramadol series of positives in Illinois, there have been two different sporadic clusters that we, ex that we suspect based on the circumstances of methamphetamine positives associated with assisted starters. So 
the horses went to this starting gate and an assistant starter had methamphetamine potentially on their hands when they handled the horse and the horses ended up being exposed. And then uh, maybe Dr. Tobin can comment, there was a recent case of very similar of BZE or cocaine contamination of a group of greyhounds racing in Florida to benzylecanine. And maybe Dr. Tobin, since he was directly involved in that case, can comment. The um, BZE is basically an environmental substance. And, and I, I would not draw the sharp distinction that Dr. Stanley has drawn between su substances in the diet and substances in the environment and indeed on the dollar bills in my pocket because I've got more dollar bills in my pocket than I have horse weed. Uh, so I, I, don't, don't, I don't in any way see a reason for that sharp distinction. Um, the second thing is that uh, when we introduced the ELISA tests, and Scott worked with me on developing the ELISA tests, we, we identified in post urine the, the low levels of BZE, and they first hit the uh, fan in California. And the solution to that problem was to introduce a cutoff. Uh, we'll just cut off the, uh, the level of that we're going to call identification at, and it was in the first published one, communicated one that I'm aware of, was in Ohio in about 99. They just wrote in the human 150 cutoff into racing. And that's still, to my knowledge, in place in uh, Ohio. And a number of other states have introduced it. In dog racing in um, Florida, there was uncertainty, oh, well, let me back up. Uh, uh, we had a circumstance in Florida where there were a number of calls for BZ at concentrations below the 150, and Kent got involved, and he negotiated with the authority there, the, uh, uh, it doesn't come up immediately, the, the regulatory body, that there would be, uh, below 100, there would be a notification of the trailer, a modest fine, but nothing on his record. Uh, so basically they had a, a, an administrative, effectively an administrative cutoff of 100 in Florida. And that was introduced in the early years of 2000. The dog racing community in Florida did not have the benefit of an individual of Kent's stature. And, and political input, and the matter of a cutoff for BZ in dog, in dog racing in Florida remained open. They brought a number of cases against, uh, principally against two trailers. Now, this is coming straight from my memory. Uh, the levels on these two trailers started at 11 nanograms per ml and varied between 11 nanograms per ml and about 30 to 50 in urine of BZE. Uh, the position was taken at the hearing that that was a regulatory cutoff, uh, but they also had earlier called a lower concentration of 3.9 on a dog trainer, showing that they could indeed test below this concentration. And the, the question was, was this uh, an arbitrary or capricious? Uh, did the lab develop and input this cutoff in on their own initiative without clearing it, without appropriate uh, regulatory uh, approval? And I believe that the answer to that question has been yes. What, was, what is very unusual about dog racing and, uh, is that the dogs are handed over from the trailer to a lead out person uh, at a time in Florida that varied between, sometimes it might be as short as an hour before the race, sometimes it might be three hours before the race. So the dog was outside of the control of the trainer, exposed to heck knows what, before the sample was actually taken. Another little variant is that the samples are now, were now being taken pre-race, and to some extent, the, you had to, uh, if a dog was, uh, it was unclear to me whether it was the dog volunteer the sample <laughs> or whether it was selected by the commission. Uh, in, uh, in other words, if you're, if you're following a dog, if it pees before the race, you collect it, and if it doesn't, I wasn't quite clear what happened. So there were, there were very great uncertainties 
about the, reason, the way that the threshold was determined and its implementation, and there was the other variability of the fact that the dog was outside the control of the trainer for quite a period before the actual sampling. These processes are still being um, uh, evolving in Florida, but there were two, there were two rulings, one quite recent, uh, supporting the position taken by the, the Greyhound trainers groups and the, the, and the, 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 Greyhound, the racing groups in Florida. Is, is that, does that answer your question, Clara? Yeah, yeah. The, the point was that the dogs are out of the control, were out of the control of the trainers, and that's, and that's where it just, it, it goes back to the question that I'm not 100% sure what Scott's differentiation between the two. I, I, I mean, there, there's obviously different sources of drug, but I still think that they should be handled the same. In a number of, of cases, we have identified potential exposures after the animal leaves the control of the trainer. And at, at that point, and there's, there's also, we have, and this is not one of these kind of substances, but it's a th therapeutic, control therapeutic medication, and that's dexamethasone. And we have two examples in Kentucky where horses that were not administered dexamethasone per the veterinarian and the horse trainer, and the trainer shipped the horse to the racetrack. It raced out of a stall, got a dex positive, shipped another horse to the same racetrack, to the same stall, and got another dexamethasone positive. And in, in the one case, it was the Red Miles, that's standard breads. And right before the standard bread meet, they have a horse show, and the Junior League horse show. And, and so there's, and during the horse show, there's sharps containers at the end of every shed row. So the point is, is that there's a lot more drugs being administered a lot more frequently to show horses than to race horses. And so the guy got assigned stalls. He didn't race out of those stalls. He didn't train out of those stalls every day at the racetrack, but he just shipped in for the races and ended up with two dex positives. And then we have a similar situation that happened at Churchill. A guy's got his own stalls. He shipped into that stall from a training center, two different horses a week apart, dex and his own positives. And, and so the, the, the point being that in that case, it's in the environment of the stall that he was assigned by the racetrack and, and had, the trainer had no control. So, I think you still have to address those the same way as RCI does, which calls it a mitigating factor in the decision-making process by the stewards or commission. I think that was actually my point, is that in the rule, they do discuss environmental, contamin environmental contamination or uh, the fact they call it exposure to human drugs of abuse. So they separate those. Uh, they're not the same, and, and that was my point. But as Hugh's presentation clearly stated, and I think that's the right way to go, either one of those can be uh, investigated for mitigating circumstance. So the, the intent is they are two separate occurrences um, that do drive a similar outcome uh, as to the findings. But in my opinion, one's more preventable. Human drug exposure to these horses is more preventable than the contamination from an unknown substance that's found in feed that is unbeknownst to the trainer, even people that are providing that as, as a source. So that's why I'm trying to separate those two issues. If you inform the grooms, if you talk to the trainers, if you give them more information about um, the potential to expose their horse, then less of it will happen. In the drug of abuse side of things, if you can reduce the amount of cocaine users, methamphetamine users, opiate abusers on the backside, it's going to be better for the work environment. Uh, you'll have fewer sick days for employees that's well established, and you reduce the probability of exposing those horses. Now, in some of those cases, and I believe it was uh, Mr. Schultz that brought up the fentanyl class drugs. Those are extremely potent opiate substances, a thousand times more potent than morphine. If those fentanyl analogs or fentanyl themselves become exposure to horse, we've actually demonstrated over many years that those are potent stimulants at certain doses. So those are medications that need to be heavily regulated and they need also to be very closely monitored if there's abuse on the backside. So all I'm advocating for is that uh, continuing education be put in place, 
so that trainers understand the risk factors, the exposure to these environmental contaminant um, are slightly different than the human drug of abuse, and they need to be investigated by a different mechanism. You can't go back and test horse feed to find somebody in the barn that's used cocaine or methamphetamine. Yes, I, I agree with uh, what Dr. Stanley said, and frankly, I, I find these uh, mitigating factors uh, aggravating because, <laughs> <laughs> because they are uh, an opportunity that we have not addressed seriously enough. Uh, I think that both trainers uh, are beginning to uh, instruct their employees, and, and I know some in New York have done that quite seriously. But also associations and commissions uh, can do a better job sanitizing and, uh, and working on their employees as well. So there's a, there's a lot to be done we can, we can narrow this window down. Uh, I, I see it as opportunity uh, to minimize um, what are mitigating factors and, and also mini minimize the aggravation that comes from them. And uh, as a result, hopefully have uh, fewer uh, hearings for environmental contamination and human drug use uh, hearings. That was, that got on off on a little different track than, than what I had hoped, but it actually was a great discussion. I, I completely agree with what Hugh and, and Dr. Stanley said. I, it's our responsibility to do everything we can to mitigate those factors. The point I, I think I was trying to make, and I agree, you could maybe human transfer versus environmental contamination. I don't think Scott, even though he doesn't have any published screening limits. In my research of the California figures, Dr. Stanley has never called a cocaine at the levels that were called in Florida. And that avoids having to go through any of the process that we talked about de dealing with mitigating factors. The, the mitigation is that the levels were so low that it shouldn't have been called in the first place. And that was the only point I was trying to make is that some states have published screening limits. Other states through their labs have internal screening limits and most likely if you have either of those you're okay. The problem being there are yet other labs in other states where the Racing Commission hasn't instructed the lab that there are internal screening limits and then it becomes limit of detection which I assume is what happened in Florida and then you have a rash of positives that more than likely, whether we call it human, let's, let's call it human transfer, that more than likely we're human transfer and shouldn't have never got to the stewards to be mitigated. I'd like to throw out to the panel the, the question of, uh, that came up very clearly in the Greyhounds was the transfer of the, the dogs to the, the leads. And we have a similar situation when horses go into the starting gate and we have some evidence of possible transfer during starting gates. So it, would it be appropriate to recommend, uh, we've just recommended that traders take all possible precautions to make sure their staff are clean. Would it be appropriate to assure, assure that the other folks handling the horse between the transfer and the actual testing process are needed in the collection process itself are uh, free of these human prescription and environmental substance and recreational substances. Uh, I'll jump in again. I, I think it's always a good idea to, um, to advise some level of employment screening for people that are in contact with the animals. I, I don't see a downside to that at all. I think though that um, many of these, I think you have to look at the contact time as well. The grooms, the trainers, assistant trainers, the people in the shed row have a lot more contact time with the horse than the few seconds that they might be in contact in the starting gate. Uh, in addition to that, the other people uh, are often um, put in a situation like the horse identifier where they're wearing gloves during the contact with the horse. So it may be a certain circumstance where you could recommend that gloves be worn by the starting gate attendees. Uh, I, I know that's not going to be something that, that would be particularly popular, but those gloves actually can be uh, fairly, I mean, you can still keep your dexterity with a, with a, a latex style glove 
on them. So I think there's a couple of different approaches that could be investigated. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little unaware of the circumstances that you're talking about where there's actually scientifically demonstrated exposure in the starting gate. I think it's more hypothetical than, than an actual uh, determined source. Are you, free, um, are you free to comment? But I, I, you know, if it's a new case that's up and coming, then I may be unaware of that. But certainly the best way to do that would be to minimize the, the exposure by asking them to wear gloves or, or do pre-employment screen. We've got about 10 minutes left. I want to open it up to questions. I know John had his hand up, then Marty. Yeah, they're pretty standard. They're, there's not that much variability between lab to lab and what they do. They use a national standard for uh, human transportation and pre-employment. So it's, it's very uh, standardized throughout that. Uh, the, the panel that they use is generally for screening for uh, methamphetamine, for cocaine, PCP, for opiates. So it's, it's a fairly large panel. The, the ones that could get problematic are the opiate specifically synthetic uh, fentanyls etc those are probably not part of the routine panel and may have to be a special request is the panel yeah the panel will be sensitive enough if your groom is training uh, is uh, tested down to 150 nanograms and haven't resulted in a positive it's highly unlo unlikely lower than that would result in exposure of a horse in a positive yeah, I, I would look at the uh, Health and Human Services, um, you know, uh, mandatory guidelines for urine testing. And I'll tell you, I'm a big advocate of something that hasn't been approved yet, but it's on its way, and that's oral fluid testing. You know, part of the problem with the federal human drug testing program is it's relatively ineffective. I hate to say that, being that's what I do a lot of. Uh, but there's so much synthetic urine going on there that any, any high school kid knows how to beat the test. Oral fluid testing is one, two, three. It's a swab, you get an oral sample, you send it to the laboratory. And, and there are two major panels right now. The, the, they've expanded because of the opiate epidemic, the testing to the four big uh, opioids, uh, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. But there's another panel that I'm also, I think is worth looking at, depending on where you are at. Uh, and that's the oil and pipeline industry. They're looking at the synthetic cannabinoids, uh, the synthetic cannab uh, cathinones, uh, you know, and the drugs that, are, that, that you find. When you, when you, well, the problem is when you test for like A, B, and C, well, the drug users, they go to D, E, and F, you know? And, and I tell you, if, you got a, if you're running an offshore oil rig, you can't put up with that. There's no way you're gonna allow you know, synthetic cannabis out there. Um, and, and, and so they, 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 they have done a pretty good job of moving forward on it. Of course, the only downside to this is do you have any employees left after you test? You know, and, and again, I think what, you, what, what I have found is that you can do that, but you have to just be flexible with THC. And THC is not something that shows up in any of these uh, on the equine tests. Uh, but recognize that that's the one I think employers had to recognize, I mean, not only because of the medical marijuana issues, but because it, 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 it's a social norm out there now. So. Marty. Yeah. I know we had something similar with the dexamorphine, I believe. But I was wondering if, if if that individual wanted to find out if it was either a, a D or an L, he's already sure. had a split sample. How would, because what? I'm thinking in this, and when that happened with the dex, uh, that because it was a different isomer, he, he was found. You need to. You need Marty, to I, I think before we have two that want to respond to yeah, this. Yes, I'd like to go oh. first. Um, Marty, I, I just 
might recommend that you guys take it offline. If it's an active case that's about to be heard in front of a regulator, we have people in here that are going to report on today's um, discussions. And I just might recommend that you have that discussion offline rather than in an open forum because you said it's pending. Uh, um, I'll, I'll comment first and then we'll pass it to an RMTC actual <laughs> member of the Scientific Advisory Committee um, that our, our organization, the NARB organization, just proposed at the last model rules meeting that that cutoffs be adopted for the, the top three, methamphetamine, morphine, and benzalecanine, cocaine. Um, we did propose thresholds that we felt were legitimate pulling from the literature, but also expected the Scientific Advisory Committee to review those, realizing RCI actually has a section that says, like was referred to, like Hugh referred to, there's a section that says that these things should, that, that thresholds or cutoffs, screening limits should be established for substances of environmental transfer, but then they don't actually have any listed besides caffeine pretty much caffeine and some other some other things but but none of these substances are addressed but they do have the framework where these things can be plugged in and i understand that the rmtc scientific advisory committee has taken up our proposal and maybe scott can comment from there um i can comment only generically the uh the rmtc scientific advisory committee is is one step in the process of getting things approved uh, and ultimately it has to go uh, through the ARCI and, and be approved by uh, several steps in their committees as well. It's my understanding uh, that uh, RMTC spokesman Dion Benson uh, would represent an answer to any specifics on that, but I can tell you it was discussed. These have been discussed and been moved forward as recommendations uh, to the ARCI in some, in some of the cases. And I will speak generically as well. I believe that the ARCI in, in discussions with Mr. Martin is de desires to move quickly rather than slowly on this matter. Now, quickly in a regulatory process doesn't mean next week, but um, it may not mean three or four years from now, which is sometimes the case on these issues. So. Yeah, and, and I can add that even after that, each state has to adopt the rule. And, Absolutely. And, and that can take months to, you know, years for some of that to happen. It is an unfortunate circumstance that we still have is that uh, only a handful of jurisdictions actually can immediately adopt the ARCI recommendations. Most of them have to go back and get their own rule book changed, and there's a process. Other questions? Marianne. Right. No, I, I, I believe I understand what your question is and, and your frustration as well. <clears throat> one, of the, um, 
One of the structures that we do have in ROPE, the Racing Officials Accreditation Program, is the Stewards Advisory Committee that's set up in uh, sections. It goes across the uh, country and the Caribbean. And uh, I think uh, an appropriate response to your uh, dilemma would be for me to refer that uh, situation to the Stewards Advisory uh, group who in turn would do some work for you in advance that you wouldn't have to do, which would be to contact executive directors at RCI and tell them that uh, one of the things that came from this meeting today, from this con convention, was the very question that you posed. And then we can work on that and make it a point of emphasis. A point of emphasis is an active dynamic point of emphasis and then we can use it in our CEs throughout the year, our continuing educations for stewards and uh, judges throughout the country. And there is one coming up uh, in a matter of weeks, uh, well, next month, April, in uh, Delaware. And that's a large one. It usually gets uh, 40 to sometimes as many as 60 different racing officials. So it's a very good, uh, very good point, uh, and it's an important one. Uh, and I don't think it should be seen as a loophole. I think that... Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do, as Dave knows, as a safety steward, the reason I left the, the stand and left being an executive director is I wanted to get it back closer to the horses where I started as a child and to build a bridge back to working with horsemen and letting them know that officials uh, don't, don't see horsemen as uh, opposition. But uh, th this is where the work is done, and, and we have to work together and to find solutions together. And regulators and horsemen have to work for a common goal, and it has to be done the right way and done fairly and justly. So all your points are well taken, and I'll take that to the, uh, to the Stewards Advisory Committee. Thank you. I think there really needs to be some out-of-the-box thinking about this. I mean, you raised a key point that bo always bothers me, yeah. in that who's got the burden of proof on this thing? Mm -hmm. You know, again, on the federal program, you know, the, the, they've pretty much established that there really aren't going to be alternative technical explanations for the result at the cutoff levels they have. Now, if you don't want to play that game, you, that, that's fine, but you then can't shift the burden on the, 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 the donor or, in this case, the operator uh, to establish, uh, to establish that, 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 was, that they're innocent. So what I think is what needs to be thought about, just as a, as a conceptual thing, is, you, is raise these cutoffs to where you have something where they have no clinical effect or no performance effect, and then at the same time, then tri f take those animals or take those owners who have a, a detectable level and put them in a surveillance program. It may be not be fines, it may not be a record, but then go ahead and monitor the horses in, in, in the terms of it being an integrity and safety issue. Because I think that's something else that I think the other horse owners are interested in. They don't, they have the sense that people are cheating, they're not, but they're getting away with it. So that's the other problem with this contamination thing. So I think there's another model that's out there that can be used that will solve a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I just wanted to inject one point, um, being on the board for rope, and Hugh didn't mention it, but the I have put in a request, uh, spoken with Dan Fick, I've spoken with Ed Martin, uh, I've spoken with a few executive directors of racing commissions about using a model of medical review officers and hoping to put together a panel, uh, a national panel that can help assist in situations that what Marianne is talking about. So if you have that instance, you can give the information generically to this panel and ultimately get some advice before you go to your next step. Uh, the Rope Steering Committee has asked me to put together an action plan after this meeting is over, after our convention is over. So that is something that we're currently working on with rope. Yeah, that's true. Thanks, Harry. We don't want to go over, but uh, if anybody has additional questions, all of the panel members have agreed to stay up here 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, you can come up and, and ask your questions individually. I know Marty obviously has one. Uh, but to wrap it up, this was the Kent Sterling Memorial medication panel and the things that Kent did that nobody knew about. We just heard it today. How many positives, how many of the cocaine positives were dismissed in Florida? Probably 20, 30, 40 at least. So let's pick 40. $20,000 for winner's share of each race, $800,000 that could have unjustly been taken away from owners because these were trace levels. Nobody on this panel, none of the scientists on this panel would argue that those trace levels should have had the purses taken away. Kent 
through his vociferous advocacy and his knowledge of medication, saved the owners $800,000. 40 trainers who were looking at a class A one, a year, lo year loss of their career, which in a lot of cases ends their career, didn't serve a penalty because they shouldn't have served a penalty. And it was because of one man, it was because of Kent Sterling, and that's what this organization is about. Anybody has? So anybody has any questions, they're free to come up and, uh, and talk to the panel members after. Well, again, thank you to this panel. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to add is just uh, make sure you look at the title of this panel because I think there is the importance of understanding, and, and Dr. Stanley was really touching on it. I've tried to change that, that nomenclature, that how you say it. It's a, it's a transfer in many instances that, that contamination brings out a mindset and a thought process if somebody's done it intentionally or somebody has ingested something. So really take a look at this title and that's why working with Dr. Tobin, we, we wanted to make sure we don't always use the word environmental contamination. Uh, we're talking about transfers, very low levels. So that's an important part to take home and try to change when you talk about it and what you're talking about. But I want to just wrap up this convention <clears throat> with a, a, a tremendous thank you to everybody who helped put this together. Obviously our corporate sponsors are on the screen, but many affiliates sitting in the room today, um, as well as organizations that help and support the National HPPA have all been uh, very generous in financial sponsorships. Uh, I cannot thank the Louisiana HPPA enough. Um, Ed, Bernard, the, their board, what they put on here, and especially at Antoine's was uh, a, time, a time that we'll always remember. And I appreciate everything that's happened. I appreciate President Guessman helping and getting this convention together, letting me run with a few ideas that, that, uh, that I had, and hopefully they've paid off, and hopefully you've all appreciated the convention. And, and thank Robert, Audrey, uh, Sarah's here, Dennis is here, and Lauren, uh, uh, Meredith, everybody that's helped us out. Um, I want to send another special thanks to Tammy Wright again, who helps solicit sponsors for us. So it, it's a group effort, and I want to make sure that everybody knows that I'm extremely appreciative of all the help, and I'm glad you guys were here. So thank you very much. <laughs>